Hello, my name is Rebecca Bates. And I am the Technical Assistance Project Manager for ADAPT. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Rita Noonan and Dr. Grant Baldwin. Dr. Rita Noonan is a sociologist and the branch chief in CDC's Division of Overdose Prevention. Dr. Noonan and her staff oversee prevention and evaluation strategies that support the CDC's Overdose Data to Action Program. This program is designed to reduce drug overdose deaths and related harms in the United States by providing funding to 47 states and 16 large city and county health departments to improve public health surveillance, implement evidence-based prevention strategies, and to shed light on emerging innovations in the field. Dr. Noonan also works closely with several high-intensity drug trafficking areas, managing the public health component of ONDCP's overdose response strategy that links public health and public safety across 30 states. She has been the recipient of several prestigious awards, including a Fulbright Scholarship and a MacArthur Fellowship. She received her PhD from Indiana University. Dr. Grant Baldwin is the Director of the Division of Overdose Prevention at CDC's National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. He leads the division in monitoring trends in the drug overdose epidemic and other emerging drug threats, identifying and scaling up prevention activities to address the evolving drug crisis and supporting local drug-free community coalitions. As the scope, scale, and complexity of America's drug overdose epidemic changed, the Division of Overdose Prevention was created to serve as a necessary and essential focal point to CDC's more expansive and diversified work in the area. Dr. Baldwin has served at CDC for over 20 years. He received his PhD in Health Behavior and Health Education at the University of Michigan and an MPH in Behavioral Sciences and Health Education from Emory University, where he's currently an affiliated professor. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rita Noonan and Dr. Grant Baldwin. Well, thanks so much. It's an honor and privilege for Rita and me to be with you this morning. We will, be attending, we will be attempting to synthesize the science of substance use prevention with an eye towards how layered protections and transformational change are needed to support our drug overdose prevention efforts. We'll provide the latest data on the crisis, describe CDC's strategic approach, and draw parallels with the COVID-19 pandemic. We will then sp spend the bulk of our time discussing some of CDC's signature and mission, mission serving investments. As you know, we had the highest number of drug overdose deaths ever recorded in 2020. This political cartoon makes the connection between the COVID-19 pandemic and the drug overdose crisis. Since the onset of the pandemic, we know that persons struggled to maintain access to essential harm reduction, treatment and recovery support services, initiated or increased substance use to cope with the stressors and social isolation created and used illicit drugs while alone more frequently. In reality, drug overdose deaths were rising in 2019 before the pandemic, after the slight dip in 2018, because of changes in the illicit drug marketplace. This is data from our Drug Overdose Surveillance and Epidemiology System, or DOSE, and documents suspected non-fatal drug overdoses presenting presenting to emergency departments. The bars on the graph show total ED visits, and the lines show ED visits for suspected uh, overdoses from all drugs, that's the purple line, opioids, the light blue line, heroin, the dark blue line, and stimulants, the royal blue line. It pulls from 42 states and DC that we're sharing uh, syndromic surveillance data with CDC's dose system from January 2019 through September, of 2020. Note that non-fatal overdose ED visits were rising throughout 2019. From March through September of 2020, there was a su substantial decline in the number of total ED visits across the United States, at least in part because of delays in seeking care or avoiding care in EDs during the COVID-19 pandemic. However, nationwide non-fatal overdoses did not decline at a similar pace. Just actually, just the opposite occurred. Year over year comparisons show that the numbers of suspected overdose ED visits for all drugs, opioids, heroin, and stimulants increased with the peak month of ED, visit, ED visits varying uh, by month for each substance. So provisional data on drug overdose deaths in 2020 estimate that over 93,000 people died last year, an over 30% increase from 2019. 
as I said, this is a concerning acceleration of overdose deaths during the COVID-19 pandemic. Synthetic opioids excluding methadone, largely illicitly manufactured fentanyl, are really the primary driver. Drug overdose deaths involving this category of opioids increased 58% from 2019 to 2020 alone and continue a troubling trend. The figure on the slide is from uh, CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, or MMWR, from February, where we characterized 2019 drug overdose trends and looked specifically at the role of synthetic opioids other than methadone, again, largely IMFs. Between 2013 and 2019, overdose death rates for synthetic uh, opioid co-involvement, that's the graph on the left, increased six-fold for prescription opioids, 27-fold for heroin, 32-fold for cocaine, and 18-fold for psychostimulants with abuse potential, largely meth. In the absence of synthetic opioid co-involvement during the same period, that's the graph on the right, Death rates increased threefolds for psychostimulants and just slightly for cocaine from 1.5 to 1.7 per 100,000. However, rates decreased for prescription opioids and heroin involved deaths. In short, we have an independently growing meth problem on top of an opioid crisis driven by IMF. We have lost over 840,000 of our fellow Americans since 1999. This chart shows drug overdose deaths overall and deaths by some specific drug categories, as well as a line indicating the percent of deaths involving any opioid. It gives you a sense of the scope and scale of the drug crisis and how it, it, it has evolved over the past 20 plus years. If we look back uh, just for a few years, we would not have the context that this slide provides. So for comparison, 16,849 Americans died of a drug overdose in 1999. In this more expansive view, you can see the increase in prescription opioid deaths beginning in 1999, that's the gray bar, and the skyrocketing of deaths involving IMF and fentanyl analogs starting in 2013, that's the light blue bar. Also note the surge in deaths involving psychostimulants with abuse potential and cocaine, the orange and red bars, from about 2015 onward. From 1999 to 2019, the percent of deaths involving any opioid increased from 48 to 71%. During these years, drug overdose deaths increased fourfold. Opioid overdose deaths increased sixfold. Remarkably, deaths from synthetic opioids excluding methadone increased 50-fold and psychostimulants uh, deaths increased 30-fold. At the outset of the current drug overdose epidemic, those most impacted were white, rural, and men between the ages of 25 and 54. But now it is an everybody problem. On this slide, I wanted to call specific attention to racial and ethnic disparities and how recent changes in the drug marketplace are disproportionate, disproportionately impacting persons of color. So from 2013 to 2019, the graph on the left Opioid overdose death rates increased over 80% for among non-Hispanic whites, but almost 265% among non-Hispanic blacks. So now opioid overdose death rates for whites and blacks nearly mirror each other. From 2004 to 2019, that's the graph on the, the graphs on the right, non-Hispanic black and American Indian and Alaska native persons had higher death rates for cocaine and psychostimulants than any other ethnic group. For cocaine, the two graphs on the bottom, Blacks have historically had higher rates, but the disparity has increased in recent years. So overall, the increase in overdose deaths are occurring against a backdrop of overall stable or declining rates of illicit drug use, other than cannabis, underscoring that's really the illicit drug supply as a key driver of the current overdose crisis. IMF, which is easier and less costly to make, distribute and sell is observed, as you saw, in a steadily increasing percentage of overdose deaths and has displaced heroin altogether in the illicit drug market in some communities. The increasing availability, geographic dispersion, mixing or co-use of IMF with other drugs, and the presence of IMF and counterfeit prescription pills resembling commonly misused prescription drugs underscores the urgency to evolve our approach to prevention. 
83% of opioid overdose deaths and 63% of all drug overdose deaths involves synthetic opioids, excluding methadone for the 12 months ending in February of this year. So the risk of overdose is elevated with any use of IMF, given its potency, lethality, and the variability in the illicit supply. But the risk is particularly high among persons who are opioid naive or whose tolerance to opioids has decreased following periods of abstinence. It is, as the uh, uh, image on the slide implies, the elephant in the room. Addressing this crisis requires strong and collaborative multi-sector partnerships within communities. Currently, I'm reading the book Lifeline by, by uh, Dr. Leanna Wen. In uh, her memoir, memoir, she documents her experiences as the Baltimore City Health Commissioner, including the challenges of addressing the drug overdose epidemic and violence in her community. When describing the importance of bringing people together, she said, we don't need to find common ground. We need to find higher ground that addresses common interests. This resonated with me because it calls us not only to do more, but to do something different and better. So for the purposes of today, it can serve as a call to action to how we orient and synthesize our prevention efforts. So where do we go from here and how do we address the drug overdose epidemic? First, we need to strengthen upstream prevention with a focus on addressing adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. We need to create the conditions for strong, thriving families and communities where children and youth are free from harm and can achieve lifelong health and well being. This involves preventing ACEs before they happen, identifying those who have experienced ACEs, and responding using trauma informed approaches to lessen future harms. Second, we need to better support harm reduction and expand the provision and use of naloxone and overdose prevention education. We should expand locations where these services are offered and co-locate services whenever possible, including in primary care settings, retail pharmacies, support groups, outpatient SUD treatment programs, syringe service programs, and via mobile outreach. Third, we need to expand access to and provision of treatment for substance use disorders. Additional efforts should be made to train clinicians about the evidence supporting MOUD treatment and to reduce stigma. Encourage clinicians to become data 2000 waived and prescribe MOUD up to their patient limit. Fourth, we need to intervene early with individuals at the highest risk of overdose, especially those historically underserved, such as persons experiencing homelessness, those transitioning from institutional settings such as the criminal justice system, and those with a previous non-fatal overdose. And finally, we need to improve detection of overdose outbreaks due to fentanyl, fentanyl analogs, or other drugs to facilitate a more effective response. At CDC, we have six key strategic uh, pillars that anchor our approach. They are first monitoring, analyzing, and communicating trends. So timely, high quality data help public health officials and other decision makers both understand the extent of the problem, focus resources where they are needed most, and evaluate the success of our prevention efforts. Second, build state, tribal, local, and ter territorial capacity. States, tribes, local communities, and territories play a critically important role in preventing overdoses and substance use related harms. They regulate controlled substances, license healthcare providers, respond to overdose outbreaks, detect emerging trends, and manage large public insurance programs such as Medicaid and workers' compensation. So third, supporting providers, health systems, payers, and employers. Providers and health systems are crucial in promoting safer, more effective opioid prescribing, providing evidence-based treatment for substance use disorders, and supporting care coordination. Private and public insurances, uh, insurance and pharmacy benefit managers can help address gaps in coverage and remove barriers uh, for treatment. Employers can offer comprehensive benefits and support employees affected by an SUD. Fourth, partnering with public safety and community organizations. CDC continues to build partnerships through uh, multiple public health and public safety collaborations, which Dr. Noonan will talk about, as well as working with community-based organizations. These efforts support the needs of those at risk of an overdose and bridge knowledge, data, and service gaps 
that can impact the success of community-wide overdose prevention efforts. And finally, we're trying to raise public awareness and reduce stigma. CDC is raising awareness about the risks of substance use, promoting evidence-based treatment for SUD, and advancing the understanding that addiction is a chronic disease and not a moral failing. CDC also works to reduce stigma by addressing misinformation, endorsing non-stigmatizing language, and promoting awareness of stigma's impact on health and health outcomes. So here are our guiding principles. They really serve as a touchstone for, for what we do. They include promoting health equity, uh, addressing underlying factors, partnering broadly, taking evidence-based action, advancing science, and driving innovation. Before we talk about some of our specific prevention initiatives, I want to draw some parallels between the COVID-19 pandemic and the U.S. drug overdose crisis. So both have exposed and spotlighted um, systematic shortcomings in our response capabilities within and across sectors, differential impacts on specific populations and long-standing health inequities, the necessity of a multi-pronged approach to prevention and response, and the urgency of creating conditions where everybody can thrive. So let me walk through each of them in de some detail. This graph shows the recently revised 10 essential services in public health, the COVID-19 pandemic and the US drug overdose crisis have exposed, frankly, the inadequacy of our patchwork public health infrastructure because of chronic underinvestment. Without exception, I would argue that we need to do better on delivering all of these ser services and that our long-term success hinges on these needed improvements and constant reinvestment. So timely, comprehensive, localized, integrated, and actionable data is a mantra for our drug overdose surveillance activities. The COVID-19 pandemic spotlighted the urgent need to modernize our activities even further. Gaps in data availability left us scrambling to characterize the pandemic properly in real time and hampered our prevention and response activities thereafter. This undercut the utility and relevance of the data. So we need more timely, more comprehensive, more localized, and more actionable and integrated data. Success in addressing the COVID-19 pandemic in a community also depended on us layering multiple prevention strategies on top of one another. I'm particularly fond of this Swiss cheese analogy where each slice of cheese represents an intervention with inherent shortcomings like masks, social distancing, hand hygiene, ventilation, contract tracing, and of course, vaccination. That said, when stacked on top of one another, a person's risk of, a, of exposure to SARS-CoV-2, that's the virus that causes COVID, plummets. And while the science underscoring the efficacy of each intervention is clear, the deploying them, as you know, is not without controversy. Just think of the widely divergent views held on mask mandates, social distancing rules and vaccination requirements. The same layered approach is needed to address the US drug overdose epidemic and polarized views exist here too. So for us, we have to debate and defend MOUD, SSPs, pre-arrest diversion programs and many other interventions, all the while overcoming false narratives and stigma associated with persons who use drugs. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought social and racial injustice and inequity to the forefront of public health. It has highlighted how much further we have to go to achieve health equality. COVID-19 has unequally affected many racial and ethnic minority groups, putting them more at risk of getting sick and dying from SARS-CoV-2 exposure. Some of the many inequities in the social determinants of health include discrimination in systems meant to protect well-being or health, such as in healthcare, housing, education, criminal justice, and finance. It also includes racism that shapes social and economic opportunities and can lead to chronic and toxic stress. Healthcare access and use is another barrier. Education, income, and wealth gaps also contribute by limiting access to high quality education and acquiring jobs that have a de decreased risk, in this case, of the exposure to the virus. Finally, a higher percentage of people from racial and ethnic minorities live in crowded housing that increase their risk for COVID-19. These same social determinants of health are likely contributing to the sharp increase in death rates 
for non-Hispanic Blacks and American Indians and Alaska Natives that I showed earlier. So whether it is the COVID-19 pandemic or the US drug overdose crisis, one critical pathway for action is to improve overall social, behavioral, and community health. To do this, we need to invest in these seven areas, the ones listed on the slide. It is about moving upstream and investing in uh, these vital conditions that ultimately predispose persons for good health. This framework places communities at the center of our work to achieve collective well being. Cultivating these vital conditions is critical to build community capacity in communities and provides, frankly, an equitable approach for all of us to thrive together and maximize health for all. So now more than ever, let's start talking about some of our uh, prevention programs specifically. There's a real need to seamlessly integrate data informing action, as you heard, because of the potency and rapidly shifting illicit drug marketplace. So this is a map of the 66 funded jurisdictions who are part of CDC's over to, uh, overdose data to action program, or what we like to call OD2A. This is 47 states, DC, two territories, and 16 big cities or counties who all receive funding. This is $300 million per year, now for four years, so it's a $1.2 billion program. OD2A encompasses a breadth and depth of prevention strategies, PDMPs, state and local integration, linkage to care, provider and health system supports, public health uh, and public safety partnerships, and many others. Overall, overall, our jurisdictions receive anywhere between 2.3 and $7.5 million in funds with a tremendous amount of flexibility to tailor what they do to their local needs um, and test out some new evidence-informed prevention strategies. And at least 20% of the funds they get must be used and go directly to some of the communities that are hard hit. Also, we're trying to adapt OD2A to meet the moment. So as the drug overdose crisis has evolved, we of course are needing to think differently and implement new and innovative approaches um, and of course, the COVID-19 pandemic itself hampered some of our recipients' ability to execute some of what they planned to do to begin with. So to help address these challenges, we are, as I said, extending OD2A. It was supposed to be a three-year program. It's now a four-year program. We're also offering our jurisdictions flexibility to strengthen their response by expanding the scope of OD2A to include polysubstance use and prescription and illicit stimulants. Given the data that I showed earlier, you know how important this is. And finally, we're leveraging partnership cooperative agreements to add additional support to recipients, including to fill critical health department positions and expand investments in localities via offsets from off, um, unspent funds. And beyond OD2A, we have a number of other significant investments. In 2016, CDC uh, uh, put out its opioid prescribing guideline. We'd say we'd revisit them as new evidence became available and that's exactly what we're doing now. So areas updated in the guideline will include providing additional detail on non-pharmacologic and non-opioid pharmacologic therapies for chronic pain, updating information on the benefits and risks of non-pharmacologic, non-opioid pharmacologic and opioid therapies for chronic pain, expanding guidance on acute pain and exp expanding guidance on opioid ta uh, tapering. So draft guiding uh, guideline has been written and is going through extensive peer review vetting and revision. We hope to publish this um, in 2022. Just a couple more slides from me before I turn it over to Dr. Noonan. In 2017, we launched the now Emmy award-winning Rx Awareness Campaign. This is the first ever federal um, health effort to raise awareness about the dangers of prescription opioids. The campaign tells the stories of real people whose lives were impacted by prescription opioids. The goals of the campaign are full four, to increase awareness that prescription opioids can be addictive and dangerous, to lower prescription opioid misuse, to increase the number of patients seeking non-opioid pain management options, and finally, to increase awareness about recovery and to reduce stigma. In July of last year, we launched the new RX Awareness Stories featuring audiences who've been heavily impacted, including pregnant women, veterans, younger adults, older adults, and importantly, American Indians and Alaska Natives. And based on the lessons learned from the initial release, the new campaign messages evolved to be both more positive, more empowering, and frankly, more hopeful. So year to date in 2021, uh, some huge uh, 
performance metrics, uh, metrics uh, 650,000 clicks to the RX Awareness homepage, over 20.8 million views of our testimonial videos, um, almost 205 million impressions for both our radio and TV PSAs, and over 9 million impressions specifically uh, for the AI AN testimonials. The Opioid Resource Exchange is projected, uh, was launched in August of this year. It's a central collection of CDC reviewed communication materials and educational resources about opioid misuse, addiction, treatment, and overdose prevention for state and local health departments, nonprofit and community based organizations, healthcare providers, and public health professionals. I encourage you to check out the URL on the slide. It's a fabulous um, repository of resources, if you will. And finally, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Rita next, CDC has just launched our four new evidence-based campaigns, mini campaigns to prevent and reduce drug overdose in young adults ages 18 to 34 under the banner of Stop Overdose. The campaigns address the risks of polysubstance use, the dangers of fentanyl, the life-saving power of naloxone, and uh, stigma around treatment and recovery for those experiencing an SUD. So again, here, cl please click on the URL listed on the slide to gain access uh, to these wonderful campaigns. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Re uh, Noonan. Rita? Thank you, Grant. That was a wonderful uh, overview. Thank you for setting the context so well, so comprehensively. I also wanted to just thank our ONDCP colleagues. Before I get started, you are always in the trenches with us and always on the edge of um, innovation. And we love working with you. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you to Laura uh, Peppard, Dr. Peppard and the whole ADAPT team in Washington, Baltimore, Haida and all those folks who made this possible. So thanks so much. Um, I think Grant really set, this, set the stage for what I wanna talk about is more programmatic and some of the investments that we've made in our division and in the agency. So I want to start with the slide in front of you is uh, about the drug-free coalitions. And those, I think many of you are familiar with the drug-free coalitions, launched in 1998 and has really grown substantially over the last several years. And over 2,000 communities uh, are being touched by this program right now. You may or may not recall from last year, we were here talking to many of you about how this is a program that um, we work on with ONDCP. We administer it, but it is funded by ONDCP and very closely coordinated and supported with CADCA. So we feel like this is a, a great highlight for us to start telling all of you about and how we're working together in communities across the country. Of note, uh, one in five Americans now live in a DFC community and they're doing a whole wide variety of activities. You can see all those sectors that are highlighted there provide ample opportunity to work in whatever might make most sense for that community. And that's really the beauty of this program, that there are ways to address prescription opioids, to work with schools, work with businesses, et cetera. So it's a very resilient and flexible program. So I wanted to just start with that. We'll go to the next slide and I'll tell you just a little bit more about, uh, as CDC has been trying to implement this program and give a little structure and a little focused vision, we have zeroed in on three areas as overarching priorities. I won't belabor them too much because I think some of you may be aware already, but one is that we want to advance coalition collaborations. We have a whole branch at CDC now in the Division of Overdose Prevention, which uh, Dr. Baldwin, which Grant runs. There's a brand new branch, our DFC branch, and it fosters coalition connections across all the youth substance use prevention networks, increasing cohesion with state and local partners, sharing CDC data expertise and resources, and again, maximizing all these partnerships that can help us effectively prevent youth substance use misuse. Um, another strategic priority is advancing community health. So this DFC branch champions public health by tailoring expertise and promoting evidence-based prevention strategies with coalitions and in communities further enabling them to address things like health equity and get to some of those root causes and risk factors for youth substance use. And the third is advancing coalition capacity and really trying to improve some of the operations around streamlining grants management, uh, finances, and some of those requirements that are a little less sexy, if you will, but they're supremely important 
in helping any program run well. So that just tells you a little bit more. And in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the next slide, please. On this slide, you'll see that we have um, this funny acronym, IOPSL. And that stands for Implementing Overdose Prevention Strategies at the Local Level. And this is basically a cooperative agreement, one of the mechanisms we use at CDC to work with lots of our partners and state health departments and local health departments. We do this particular initiative, or we, we stood this up with NACHO. And many of you have heard of NACHO. It's the National Association of County and City Health Officials. We started this in 2019 as a way to mirror what Grant was talking about with the Overdose Data to Action Program by uh, working with somewhat smaller cities and communities, more localized efforts to provide funding to conduct overdose surveillance, prevention, and response work. Again, it's a very comprehensive interdisciplinary and integrated public health approach. And we provide roughly around $6.7 million in funding for this. You can see we started with four cities, again, fairly large, but not the largest cities, uh, Los Angeles, Seattle, Indianapolis, and Milwaukee. And then we are expanding out to have additional rounds. And you can see on this slide what those places are. Let's move to the next slide. I wanted to include this slide just so you know that CDC is also funding tribes to address the opioid epidemic and the drug overdose problem more generally. We're funding 11 tribal epicenters or epidemiology centers with a total of $2 million each for three years. You can see those that are listed on the slide. And the idea is to provide technical support to tribes and other key partners for data collection, use, and for sharing. And I really like how all of our epidemiology, or EPI for short, and surveillance activities, uh, I think really encapsulate what our philosophy is in Indian country. And it's just, it can be summed up in six words. And I love anything that can be summed up simply, but really it's about better data, better response, and better prevention. So we're extending this in, into Indian country as well. So I wanted you all to be aware of that. Let's click to the next slide, please. The overdose response strategy, many of you in the room or virtually in the room, and sorry, we're not in person, hopefully next year. Um, a lot of folks I imagine in the audience have heard something about the overdose response strategy. It is one of the areas that um, I talk, one of the programs I talk a lot about with audiences like this one. Um, basically, this is a collaboration with ONDCP again. It's a collaboration between public health and public safety and we collaborate with high intensity drug trafficking area programs or HIDA programs. And we are currently in 30 states, and this is finally called the ORS. The goals simply put are to coordinate data sharing between public health and public safety, could be law enforcement or public safety more broadly, developing and supporting the implementation of evidence-based programs or strategies, and Third, to strengthen engagement of local communities and promote the inclusion of those most impacted by the crisis when we're designing, planning, or implementing any of the ORS activities. And the basic model, I won't, um, I won't belabor it, I think you're somewhat familiar, but the basic model is that we combine a public health analyst and a drug intelligence officer in each HIDA, and you can see the states that we are in, in the, the light blue states. Um, we are expanding to make this a national program with, again, the great, I think, vision and support from ONDCP and CDC, um, working with the CDC Foundation. We are expanding this to a national program, and we're just extremely proud of this. And if you make a note of that link there, I think there's resources that will be shared afterwards. That link on the slide here is essentially your one-stop shop for everything related to the ORS. You can sign up for our newsletter, you can get contact information about the PHA or public health analyst in your state and anything else of interest. And you know you can always contact me if something pops up and you have a question. Let's go to the next slide. This was one of my little babies. And I uh, am very proud of this little booklet that we fondly call our little purple menu. It is essentially what I would call a knowledge translation or a knowledge synthesis. We looked around the, the world of evidence. We look through journals, we talk to people, and we try to distill down as simply as possible the 10 strategies that we think have the strongest evidence that we think could be implemented in communities all over the United States. It is written for practitioners, it's written for all of you in this audience, 
And I think it's very easy to follow. It's a one pager essentially front and back that has a section on somebody who's done this already. And just to sort of, you know, clump some of the areas of intervention, we have some harm reduction strategies that are highlighted in this little purple menu. Um, we have uh, strategies that are associated with MAT. Now we're calling medications for opioid use disorder. Sometimes we're referring to it as MOUD. But we can see things like working with uh, justice involved populations, um, having targeted naloxone, good SAM laws, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that there's really sort of a nice array, 10 different strategies. And I would encourage you to look at these and see if any of them work for you. And if you need and want more assistance around them, this is a, a, a sort of a short synthesis, we can certainly point you in the right direction. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, Grant talked about fentanyl test strips, and I think this is a somewhat new area for us. As of April 2021, CDC and SAMHSA funding can be used to purchase fentanyl test strips to support drug checking or drug surveillance. And again, I've mentioned things like evidence and evidence base. Um, this is really one of the core principles at CDC and um, with really all of our partners, certainly with our public safety partners, law enforcement partners, we use data to drive decisions. And the, the studies that came out built the evidence base to indicate that the use of fentanyl test strips can really encourage those who are using drugs to uh, use more slowly, use less, maybe throw a batch away, use with another person around. So we think it has a lot of utility in helping people um, prevent an overdose, but also for checking drug supply. So we think there's, there's a lot of utility here. They're easy to use and they're relatively inexpensive. So I wanted to make sure I put in a note about that. Let's go to the next slide. This is another slide that you've probably heard me talk about, the Kukli's. And just as a way of remembering them, I said, oh, that's because they drive me Kukli which they don't actually. I love these. Uh, these are very small investments, again, with ONDCP's great vision and great support. We've been able to funnel money and up to date, we have put in, in um, around $12 million that go directly out into communities, smaller entities that are um, really the, the innovators, the laboratories and, and incubation systems, whether that's uh, a community-based organization, it might be uh, a local sheriff's department, it might be um, some a new innovation and you're working with a local university. But essentially, we want to cultivate all those innovations that are out in the field. So we did that with this little mechanism and funding called Combating Opiate Overdose Through Community Level Intervention, or CUCLI. We work with ONDCP. The recipient of those funds has historically been University of Baltimore. Um, and we have lots of things that we are learning along the way. And some of those we think should bubble up and get more evaluation. Some we think are ready to scale up and say, go do this. Some of these might end up in that little purple book as we revise. But I just wanted you to know that these are great opportunities for anybody who has a good idea. And I know many of you are in the audience right now saying, oh, I do something in my community. Hasn't really been evaluated and I'm not sure how I can get more funding to run it somebody will say, well, does it work? I'm saying you can evaluate things like that. You can get some, um, a little extra support to build out what you're doing and to further innovate. So keep your eye on Kukli's and we'll have an email blast about this. Uh, the next solicitation will be going out soon. So with that, let's move to the next slide in the interest of time. To round out our portfolio of what is really growing into, I think, a comprehensive suite of, um, projects and interventions and partnerships with all kinds of justice partners. You know, some are at the federal level. I've mentioned ONDCP. We've worked with local health departments, NACHO. Um, the Bureau of Justice Assistance is um, one of our sort of big three in the federal space of some of the folks that we work with who are really critical partners. We have launched, um, I think, again, some projects that are, to me, quite innovative and in working on a rural response and braiding our funding together so we can work with our, our partners who are from the Department of Justice, folks who are um, more treatment oriented. We have partners really across the board in the federal landscape to reach out to rural populations. We have been, um, just to highlight one, because I could be here all day talking about these, we have an OD map, uh, overdose detection mapping application pilot states, where we work with states and also some tribes 
to not only use that tool, and many of you are familiar with what that tool is, it's near real-time data. It can be used by first responders at the scene of a suspected overdose, and literally they just hit a button, and then they can um, make a note about whether or not naloxone was administered. Great utility in near real-time, understanding whether there's a spike. And working with some of these folks, and well, what do we do now that we know there's been a spike? What can we do that would be a meaningful sort of um, um, intervention with partners to meet the need of that community? So we have investments there, um, and we can talk more about them in the Q&A. If you see anything here you want to hear more about. Let's click to the next slide. Cornerstone projects, these sit firmly within that umbrella of the overdose response strategy and I love these because it really is a great way to showcase what public health and public safety can do together when we are sitting around a table and we'll say, you know what we're really wondering about? Collectively, we have a question and we think that we could probably address it. So we go out there and address a knowledge gap or, or maybe it's a, a practice gap or a program gap that we feel like would benefit not only public health, but also our public safety partners. And you can see here every year we launch something different that we think is really timely. We started with fentanyl, good SAM laws, linkage to care. That's a great document um, and highlights linkage to care from public safety venues, like fire stations, uh, for example. I think that that has a lot of utility for probably many of you in the audience. Overdose prevention in jails. I'm very proud of that product. Again, it's meant for practitioners and jail uh, administrators and staff who Maybe you're doing this already and want to learn how to do more or do it better, best practices. And there's also um, a way we've separated it out. So it's also reaching audiences of jail personnel who might want to adopt a strategy like that. What are barriers that someone's identified? How did they overcome those barriers? So I think these are, again, terrifically practical, user-friendly. And the one that we're doing right now is um, focused on stimulants. And I think, of course, that's been on everybody's mind. We know how um, the drug trends, as Grant, I think, very beautifully outlined for us, they continue to evolve and the role of polysubstance and the role of stimulants is growing. So we're addressing that in our next cornerstone. Let's go to the next slide, please. I won't say too much about this. I have, from time to time, told many of you about pilots that we support within the ORS, Overdose Response Strategy. Through NATO, through our partnership with NATO, we provide moderate uh, sums of money, but enough for a community and importantly, our own PHAs and DIOs within the ORS to address something that they think is important, to address something they think is innovative. And we've included things like jail-based overdose prevention and education, naloxone distribution, re-entry wraparound services. Um, we have a really interesting project with Grady that is basically a post overdose outreach program that is built on a model that Grady Hospital was using for psychiatric events. So we're really trying to, again, build evidence. This field continues to just evolve and grow. And we wanna make sure that we're not left behind in um, really waiting for perfect science or big randomized controlled trials. A lot of what we're learning is localized learning and then um, figuring out what can we scale and share or what is truly sort of a localized event. Um, so I love the pilots, and I can tell you more about those anytime you like. So let's go to the next slide. I wanted to make sure I told you about a couple of other efforts that we um, have been working on, primarily programmatic tools and things I feel like a lot of you could use when you leave this session today. And one of them is our FAST toolkit. Um, with Bloomberg Philanthropies and with CDC Foundation, NATO, whom I've mentioned, we developed a toolkit to guide localities in initiating and maintaining partnerships to reduce overdose deaths. FAST, or we call the FAST toolkit, the Public Health and Safety Toolkit and these teams. Uh, it's intended to be a longstanding strategic and action-oriented local effort. Some have done it at states, but it's largely been local groups that say, you know, we need public health. We need all these different folks at the table with public safety. It might be homeless services, it might be treatment providers, it might be harm reduction partners, et cetera, et cetera. You bring everybody around the table, you agree on your goals, you agree on what you're going to measure. And this toolkit just makes it really easy to sort of follow a little bit of a cookbook, but with enough flexibility so your locality can adapt it as needed. We've pilot tested this 
We started in York County, Pennsylvania, but we've also piloted in places like New Hampshire, Oregon, Connecticut, Ohio, Massachusetts, West Virginia. So please feel free to find this um, on our website. Nacho and others are also supporting this. We can direct you toward it, but I think it's a, a terrific resource that again, you could start using the, the minute you leave the session today. Maybe a little ambitious. Tomorrow, you can start tomorrow. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, I want to highlight one more thing. Grant mentioned something that's really important um, in this field and very important to the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control, and that is attention to adverse childhood experiences. In public health parlance, we talk about moving upstream, trying to get to those early drivers of um, the kinds of experiences that can influence a, a multitude of health outcomes. We're talking about drug overdose here, but our colleagues in violence prevention talk about adverse childhood experiences. Our colleagues in chronic disease prevention also talk about adverse childhood experiences because they shape really a trajectory of, of, of the health in a person's life. So very important to us. We have um, taken a little um, pass at a pilot project essentially here um, that I've highlighted the Martinsburg Initiative. It was initiated by the chief of police there at the time, uh, Maury Richards. And we work with the school, the police, we walk, uh, work with Shepherd University, Washington, Baltimore, Haida, NATO. It's been a great collaboration that tries to do um, what we think should be done, provide some universal kind of school-based strategies, but then have some targeted programs and wraparound services for children and families who are already uh, affected. So basically it's both primary prevention and it's trauma-informed care. So I think it's a really nice blend. And as we learn more about this, this is something that we would love to set, you know, package up and scale up. But we know there are other communities with very similar interests and we're happy to talk to you about it um, if this is of interest to you as well. Go to one more slide. I'm gonna be wrapping up here shortly. I know our time is getting short. Um, the, the Opioid Rapid Response Program, ORRP, was designed to prevent the unintended negative impacts on patient populations as a result of legal actions taken by federal authorities against prescribers of opioid or medication to treat opioid use disorder. As the name implies, the goal is to act quickly. We have components where we have trusted contacts in each state and, just, and, and DC. So information can be shared very confidentially about an impending action. Uh, we support workforce development through Project ECHO. It's a training curriculum to increase federal, state, and local capacity to care for patients with opioid use disorder or opioid depend dependence as they might be displaced through some um, law enforcement action. We have technical support for states, preparedness efforts. Um, it's really something that um, started to escalate under um, our last um, administration and uh, Health and Human Services was very interested in understanding how we could work across, again, law enforcement, public health to minimize disruption um, among patients when very necessary actions are taken to reduce supply. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and again, Grant mentioned, you know, health equity in drug overdose prevention. Um, I think the examples that he provided with COVID and um, you can really pick any health issue that you care about or can relate to personally. Um, and you can see the effects that health inequities have had on poor life outcomes, poor health outcomes. We talk a lot about um, social determinants of health. And I'm very pleased that I think there's much more of a collective effort now to understand how can we do better? What, what should we put attention on maybe that already exists but has not been scaled properly or shared uh, with populations that need it the most? What have we not asked or answered or evaluated that really would bear upon health equity? Um, I think the examples are really ripe in this kind of field. I'm happy to talk about this. I know there are lots of conversations we're just starting to have with partners and communities about health equity, but I'm very pleased that we're doing more of it and learning as we go. Um, and then the last slide, um, this is really just some little sticky notes areas with potential areas for further investment. We're investing in some of these right now, um, but some are also on our wish list of things we'd like to address if we have more time to be flexible and nimble in our approach. Uh, and again, the epidemic is shifting so dramatically. Um, so 
just wanted you to know we try to be flexible and nimble ourselves and we learn a lot from working with all of you. And this is my last slide. Um, so Oprah Winfrey or pick anybody who uh, has great quotes or is inspirational. I thought it was a nice way to end because it encapsulates a mindset I think that serves us in these ever changing times, learning from the past, thinking of the future um, and really trying to turn wounds into wisdom and action. So with that, I will close and I look forward to your, your questions and comments. And again, many thanks for letting us be here. I'm glad I had a chance to tell you a little bit about what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Noonan and Dr. Baldwin. We do have some questions that have come in. I'll address those to you at this time. The first one that came in is related to a vaccine that would prevent overdoses. Wondering if this viewer has heard about this, wondering if you have any more information on if Tracy Green that was recorded and uh, she walked through what is known, not known, what it can do, what it can't do. Uh, you know, test strips are not going to be the be all end all, the silver bullet, but they are another tool in the toolbox. And um, I will try to find that. I believe we recorded it and um, she's quite the expert. So that'd be a great research resource to look at. Yeah. Thank you. The next question that's come in is related to coalition funding. The CDC Foundation has, and you've mentioned this, that they really are implementing and organizing and coordinating the Drug-Free Communities Program. There's a viewer wondering if there are any other additional or complementary options for coalitions that are looking to launch. Hmm. Yeah, so we administer the Drug-Free Communities Program on behalf of ONDCP and in partnership with CADCA. That's a fabulous program for us. There, are, you know, obviously solicitation for new coalition goes out um, annually, um, and so a coalition can be funded up to ten years. I would encourage you to think about applying to become a DFC program. Again, as Dr. Newton mentioned, one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, which you in a community would match, but it really provides great seed money. Um, I think other potential avenues, part of what we're doing with um, some of the offset approach with overdose data to action is giving some additional flexibilities uh, for jurisdictions to reach out and potentially fund additional localities. That may be another avenue, or as Dr. Noonan mentioned, apply for these couplies. Um, you know, we love, you know, um, when we have strong applicant pools with uh, to, to um, programs like Coopley, it's better for all of us because um, we can really accelerate uh, the evidence base um, by sort of really focusing in on the most promising interventions. Dr. Noonan, do you have any other suggestions? No, but I think the Coopley is a, a great resource and it is meant to be tiered. So not everybody has to come in with a lot of evaluation capacity, for example. You know, the, the first year of funding could be sort of exploratory, you know, I think Grant mentioned, 
you know, um, doesn't have to be a lot of money sometimes to really spur an innovation and learn more about it. So I think the Kukli is a great idea. And then obviously the, the DFC um, coalitions, again, it's really seed money and there's a match. I think that's a great way for uh, coalitions to, to get in on the game for sure. Absolutely. And we do have the link to that notice of funding opportunity. We will be posting it in the chat box. So you are welcome to review that opportunity and please apply if it makes sense for you. I know they're encouraging a lot of applications. Do you remember the deadline for that, Dr. Noonan? Rick, didn't you just say what the deadline was? I'm, I'm sorry, I did not put that in my talk. Yeah, I, I, I don't recall, but we can follow okay. up with um, you know, and post it on the, the site for the, um, the date, the summit. Absolutely. So that link will be coming your way in the chat box. So you're able to download that document and it does have the deadline date. I believe it's a few weeks from now towards the end of this month. Okay. Another question that has come in and it really resonates with your example of the Martinsburg initiative, Dr. Noonan is this idea about police presence within schools and their role within substance use prevention within schools. The question is, instead of creating more police in schools, have we thought about offering interventions and more funding for mental health care on the social work and counseling side of prevention to support that? Yeah, you know, I, you know, I love the Martinsburg Initiative because it came from Martinsburg. And it was a genuine um, effort to link and bridge to local resources. Um, and uh, not just uh, Chief Richards, who, who has since retired, but others like Kim said, you know, they, they are very invested in their communities. Um, they deliver a lot of bad news. They see a lot of uh, heart-wrenching and heartbreaking um, effects of drug use. And they really appreciate being in on things that are early prevention, Grant mentioned going upstream, they wanna be part of a solution. They, they wanna be part of prevention. They also see their role to protect and serve as doing more than just you know, walking around communities and arresting people. Even the term law enforcement, lots of colleagues have said, you know, I don't even like the term because we do more than enforce laws. You know, we, it's like calling an accountant a filer of taxes. So, so uh, you know, maybe I drank all that Kool-Aid, but I am very much of the school of thought that um, our, our colleagues who are in law enforcement um, want to be part of community solutions, community policing, and that does not preclude anyone or any school from saying we can also have greater mental health services, greater support for families. There's a ton of evidence about how families can be better supported in their communities. Um, so I would say yes to all of those things. Um, yeah. Always, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the, the only thing I'd add is Dr. Noonan spoke at, at some length about the power and promise of the FAST approach, which is linking multi-sectors together. So I think when you think about going upstream um, on the ACES front as well, it's really around connecting all the, the multiple um, supports and social services together and linking them and bridging them and, and um, integrating them in ways that make sense. And so, um, like Rita said, yes to all of that. It just needs to be done in a coordinated uh, way. And I also would just put in one more plug about you know, evaluating and understanding optimal ways to do it. So we've talked a lot about post overdose outreach and the extent to which you know law enforcement should be involved or not involved, wearing a uniform, not wearing a uniform, going with um, other folks who are trained, you know, peer outreach specialists. So. I think some of what we want to do is just be really thoughtful about, um, you know, how we're how we're doing our work and exactly what Grant said with the collaborations you have in place. You know, you don't necessarily need everybody going in the school or everybody doing outreach, but to have a plan around it that is uh, based on evidence is what I would recommend. Dr. Noonan and Dr. Baldwin, we did have the deadline posted. It is November first for that Coakley funding. Listen, you guys are from the CDC. You are our dedicated public health partner here at the National HIDA program and with ADAPT. And I just want to thank you so much for joining us today. I know you're volunteering your time to do that. And one thing that I thought was really neat about your presentation, and Dr. Baldwin reemphasized this at the end, 
was the layered approach and also how you're synthesizing a variety of different evidence-based strategies at all levels of prevention to truly evoke maximum outcomes and quality outcomes, which is part of our mission at ADAPT as well. And so it's just so nice to have you as that public health partner and to see you here today. Thank you for taking the questions and for being with us. At this time, we're going to wrap up this session. We will send you any other additional questions that have come in so that you are aware of what folks are interested in and what they're asking. Thanks so much. Thank you. Our Thank pleasure. You. Thanks, everybody.